Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our service today. Glad that you are here. For any children that may be left in the room, you are to go off to your group groups early today to practice your music for Easter that's coming up. So I think all the children may have already left the room. So good. So if you see, oh, Abby, oh, yeah. So if there are already children that come in, uh, send them off to their groups. So good. So welcome to our service. Let's begin with a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that you've given to us. Lord, we pray that you would give us a desire to hunger and thirst after you, O God, and your righteousness. And Lord, we know that the Lord Jesus told us a long time ago that when we hunger after you and thirst after you, that we will be happy and blessed when we hunger after righteousness, when we hunger after the living God. So, Lord, I pray that in these moments that are before us that we would truly would hunger after you, that we would thirst for you. God, as we worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord, I pray for each person that is here in this room, in this building, and those that are watching online today. Lord, prepare our hearts as we sing, as we look into your word, as we look at what you're doing in our world. Lord, prepare us for all that will happen. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst. mercy come to the table he will satisfy taste of his goodness find what you're looking for for god so loved the world that he gave us one and only son to save us whoever believes in him live forever
lost our sin, find their way at the sound of your great name. I'll condemn, feel no shame at the sound of your great name. Every
sweet portion there. So before we are seated, I'm just going to ask you to remain standing. And I've never asked you ever, ever to do this ever before, but our, the makeup of the chairs today are a little bit different than normal. Uh, so if you, we're going we're gonna to have a spirit of prayer in a moment, a spirit of kind of going from this song into our prayer time. And if you would just like to come to the front today, you don't have to say anything, do anything, just stand here and we'll pray over you. So I've never done this ever before, but if you'd like to do that, and if not, that's fine. But if you'd just like to come and stand here and uh, to be prayed over today, it could be physical, it could be emotional, spiritual, it could be relationships, whatever it is, and we'll just be in agreement with prayer. So if you want to do that, let's uh, just bow our heads and you can make your way forward, and uh, we'll go and do that right now. Our Father, we come to you. We know that you are the God that has made the heavens and the earth, that you are the only true God. There are many gods, but they're all false. But we come to you today as the living and true God. God, we know that we can come to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We can come with boldness and with confidence into the very throne of of God. So, Lord, we do that today as your children. And, Lord, we ask for those that especially that have come forward today. Lord, we don't know what their burdens are, but you do. You don't, we don't know what their cares may be, but, Lord, we have been instructed to cast all of our cares upon you because you care for us. Lord, there may be burdens in this room, those that are watching online today, that are just weighing people down. Lord, we cast all of them onto you. Lord, we thank you that you are working in our midst in so many different ways. Lord, we typically think about physical things. And Lord, today we pray for Anna Carr as she has COVID and Ross Manor. Lord, we're praying for uh, Harvey and Arlene's sister-in-law today and who's been in the hospital this week but is now back home. Lord, we pray for those that have had uh, various flus and sicknesses But Lord, we also pray for heart conditions today. Lord, that you would work in our hearts, that we would have a hunger and a thirst for you like we've never had before. God, that is our prayer today. And Lord, if there's things that we need to confess, sins that are weighing us down and patterns of sin that have have really taken hold, Lord, even strongholds, Lord, we we cast all those onto you today, that you would break every chain that we would truly experience this freedom that we've sung about this morning. Lord, that we would be more and more formed into the image of Christ. Lord, that is our prayer today. Lord, we pray for your church here in Old Town. Strengthen it, make it healthy and strong. Lord, may it be thriving as we go and make more disciples in your name. Lord, to that end we would pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you. Okay, you may be seated. Now that was unplanned, and uh, so I'm just following the leading of the Holy Spirit. If you would take your Bibles, please, this morning, and we are once again going to turn to 1 Thessalonians. Uh, It's in the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians. We've been there for the last uh, number of weeks, and we're going to be there again this morning. If you haven't been able to join us over the last uh, number of weeks, we have been uh, working through a short sermon series that we've been calling Until Christ is Formed in You. Until Christ is formed in you. And we've been using 1 Thessalonians as as our text as we look at our identity, our purpose in Christ. Until Christ is formed 
in you, in us. So let's put on the screen this morning the four identities and purposes that we've been talking about. A worshiper, that we are a worshiper of the living God, that we are a servant of the living God, that we are a witness of God's salvation. And then today we're going to talk about being a disciple maker. So let's begin in chapter one just for a quick review as we kind of finish up our series today and bring everything together and, and bring it all together. And, and uh, for those that haven't been able to join us every week to kind of see what we've discovered thus far. We discovered that for these folks, there was a small group of Jewish people when Paul and Silas went to the synagogue for three consecutive weeks a small group of Jewish people said, yes, we're going to believe in Jesus as our Messiah. And then there was a large group of God-fearing Gentiles that were also in that city of Thessalonica, and they became followers of Jesus. And then I've been quoting the verse in Acts incorrectly, that uh, it says that, uh, it says, let me see, not not a few, which is kind of an interesting way of putting it, not a few prominent women. So really, uh, a a large group of prominent women, uh, most likely the wives of prominent leaders in that city, also came to Christ, and boom, there was this new church that was formed uh, within a matter of three to six weeks that Paul and Silas was there. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, it says that they turned from idols to worship God. Now, this is just a review. They turned from their false gods to worship the true God, and they served the true and the living God. So they became worshipers, and they became servants, just like that. That was their new identity. That was their new purpose in life, to be worshipers of the living God and to be servants of the living God. Now, last week, we said that they also became witnesses. Now, let's focus on verse 8, chapter 1, verse 8. Now, I was supposed to share this verse with you last week, and I realized after the sermon was over and the service was over that we never even looked at verse 8. And this was the key verse for last week, so we need to come back and make sure we cover verse 8. It says, the Lord's message, the Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. The Lord's message, says here in the English text, rang out. Uh, Literally what it says, that it was an ongoing trumpet blast, that the Lord's message, that they they spread out, they they were proclaiming like a trumpet blast. It was like, do-do-do, do-do-do, do-do-do. It was just like constant and consistent. It, It just went everywhere. See, last week we were talking about that we are to proclaim as witnesses of Christ that there's this good news of salvation. And that's what they were doing. And they they were spreading that not just in their city, not just over in Berea or Athens. It went all the way to Corinth, all the way to Achaia. It went back probably in the other direction to Philippi. It went everywhere. They were telling about this great news of salvation that is through Jesus Christ. So they became worshipers, they became servants of the living God, they became witnesses of the salvation of Jesus, and they also became disciple makers. So that's what we want to look at today, this very, very important topic of being disciple makers. Again, in chapter 1 and verses 7 and 8, we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, but let's go back there for a moment. In verse, let's go to verse 6. You became imitators of us. You, were, you, you mimicked everything that we did. You became imitators of us and of the Lord Jesus. 
for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model, an example to all the believers in the whole region. See, these new disciples, these new Christians, they imitated, they mimicked everything Paul and Silas was doing as far as being a worshiper, a servant, a witness, but also to be a disciple maker. Now, what is a disciple maker? Well, these chapters describe it perfectly, I believe. So, again, let's go now to chapter 2. And again, this is still just kind of quick review from last week. It says in verse, in verse 7, chapter 2, he says, Instead, we were like young, gentle children among you. Because he, it, Paul has, has just said, he says, uh, we did not come to you to get rich. We did not come to go and say, oh, look at all of these people that have come to Christ. Uh, we weren't trying to get you know, more church members. It was that we cared for you so much. And let's continue. He says, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. What a, what a beautiful picture. Just like a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. That's our motive. We cared and loved you so much. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the good news of God, salvation of God, but our lives as well. Now, this is new material today, so chapter 2, and let's see, let's begin in verse, uh, verse 11, chapter 2, verse 11. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. So he says, we were like a mother to you, and we were like a father to you. We dealt with you like a father deals with his own children. Verse 12, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who called you into his kingdom and glory. Now, verse 11 is really one thought. And in the English, it looks like maybe it's like kind of three thoughts, but it's this thought, and it could be maybe translated this way. We pleaded with you, we encouraged and comforted you, and urged you to live lives worthy of God. That's all one thought, not three separate thoughts. One thought. We pleaded with you, we encouraged you, we urged you to live lives worthy of God. You have become these new disciples, these new followers of Jesus, and this is what is to look like. And they, and Paul says, Paul and, and Silas, we, we just urged you to do that. We pleaded with you. We helped you to move in that direction. Now, when we think of being a physical parent, and for those of you that have children and grandchildren, you know this better than I do, it is simply, and maybe this has kind of got lost somewhere with parents today. It's not just simply as a parent you want your kids to get out of the house someday. It is that you want your children to be good parents someday. Because you, so you want to instill in your children, even at a young age, what it's like to be, yes, a good adult, but also what is it going to be like to be a good parent and maybe even a good grandparent someday. Now that is the same principle that we see here of being a disciple maker. It's being a spiritual parent. Paul and Silas, they became the spiritual parents in a sense, and they were urging them and pleading their spiritual children, these new Christian disciples, to go and, and be prepared to teach and to model the next generation so that's what a disciple maker is. But Paul here, and the whole reason for this letter of First Thessalonians, as I said a couple of weeks ago, is that Paul was really, really concerned 
Because it tells us in the book of Acts that they could only stay there for three to six weeks. And, and, and the Jewish people, there were some Jewish people that came along that was really upset with Paul and Silas and literally chased them out of town. So they had to leave very quickly. And then Paul was like, maybe he said to Silas, you know, it's Timothy. He was like, I, I wonder what happened. <laughs> um, we had to leave so quickly. Did, did they actually follow through? Did they go and say, well, okay, this is too difficult? So remember what I said, he, uh, when, once they get to Athens, Paul sent Timothy back and, and to check up on them. And Timothy has come back and given a good report and say, oh, they're standing firm in the faith. They, they, have the, they have the real faith that we looked at a few weeks ago, and they're loving God and they're loving people, and they have this tremendous hope. And so, as with any parent, it doesn't matter. I'm going to quote my mother here. It doesn't matter how old your children are, you still worry about them, right? And when she uses the word, use the word worry, is the word concerned, right? You're, you're still concerned about your kids. <laughs> and so, even though these spiritual children were only uh, maybe three months along in the process, for all of us, that have been spiritual parents or our spiritual parents that we are helping people move along in it towards steps towards Jesus, we're always concerned. How are they doing? We're always kind of worried, but concerned about them. How are they doing in their faith? And that is exactly what we see here. And so Paul sends Timothy and to check up on them. So let's come now to chapter 3 in verse 2. Verse 2, we sent Timothy, who is our brother, a Christian brother, and co-worker in God's service in spreading the good news of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith. We can't. We, we couldn't go uh, physically to do it, but we sent Timothy to do it on our behalf. And the word strengthen here is to establish. We sent Timothy to establish you in your faith. It can also mean to train. Timothy went to train you, to equip you of being disciples, to be fully formed followers of Jesus. We sent Timothy to do that, and that is what he did. At the end of uh, chapter 3, in verse 11, Paul, in a sense, he says a prayer here. Now, may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and inflow, to overflow with each other and for everyone else just as ours does for you. May he strengthen, may he establish your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father, whom, you, whom the, uh, when our Lord Jesus comes with all of his holy ones. And so Paul's thoughts, okay, we need to, you need to be established. You need to be strengthened. You need to be encouraged. And that is exactly what a disciple maker does. Because when a person comes to Christ as a baby Christian, they may have a lot of struggles in their marriage. They may have a lot of struggles with their children. They may have uh, addictions. They may have a whole lot of baggage, bad baggage, that they're still dragging along with them. And a disciple maker goes and helps to strengthen them and to establish them and to train them to, to live lives as godly men and women. So that is what Paul and Silas did and so here's the official definition of being a disciple maker. Commanded. We are commanded because Jesus gives us the great commandment, right, in Matthew 28. He says, as you go, make disciples, be disciple makers, and then you are to, to, to make a disciple. You're to baptize them. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then to teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. So here's our definition. Commanded, so we've been commanded to do this, to pass on to others what we have learned about God. S simple as that. And we are to pass on 
how we are to live as a follower of Christ. That's what Paul and Silas did, and then that's what this group of new Christians, that, that, that's what they did. It's like, okay, this is what we know about the true God that you need to worship. This is how you follow Christ. So it's that simple. So let's just, we'll leave that definition up there for a moment, uh, please, Ariel. So disciple makers, now this is really important. Please listen as tently as you can. Disciple makers teach and model attitudes and actions. Disciple makers teach and model attitudes and actions that others can imitate so that the disciples can then teach and model the same attitudes and actions to others, and then it's this ongoing process. And that's what's happened for the last 2,000 years in the Christian church. So we teach and we model attitudes and actions so that others can imitate us. And so then others can imitate them, and it's that ongoing process. Now, when we think of discipleship, we typically, at least I have over the years, we think of something very formal as far as, um, you know, maybe one-on-one mentoring. So we think of formal discipleship, and there's certainly a place for that. That's very important. But there's also informal discipleship, or to be an indirect encourager. Let me, I've been thinking about this recently, and I don't know if I've ever shared uh, this couple with you before in any of my stories here in the last 23 years that I've been here. And I've kind of forgotten about this couple, but it goes back to my freshman year in high school, my freshman year in high school. So that's about 120 years ago, a long, long time ago. Okay, it seems that long. And it was a long time ago, 40 years ago, over 40 years ago. And so during that time, I was challenged by the interim pastor, Pastor Gavitt, to start attending a prayer meeting on Wednesday evenings. I'm like 14 years old. What 14-year-old kid goes to prayer meeting? But he said, you should do it. I was like, okay, I'll be there. And I went there. And then he also challenged me to go to Sunday evening church. I went to Sunday mornings, but he says, also come to Sunday evening. So here I am, this 14-year-old kid, high schooler, showing up all by myself with people that are probably in their 70s and 80s, And I was like, uh, I don't know. But there was this couple, Mr. and Mrs. Bartlett, Albion and Francis Bartlett. It's taken me all week to think of their first names because I always just referred to them as Mr. and Mrs. Bartlett at that age. And they sat right down in the front of the church, and they said, oh, come sit with us. Okay. So maybe it was like 15 minutes before the service started. So that first week, they said, well, how was your week? Oh, okay. And I would kind of share about that. And they would always ask me the same question. And I didn't realize this for years. They would ask me the same questions every single week. And I always knew I had to get there 10 to 15 minutes early because the Bartlett's were going to ask me these questions. How was your week? Have you been reading your Bible? Where have you been reading your Bible this week? Have you been praying? Have you been listening to Christian music? Now, I think they... You know, they were, you know, probably about 80 years old. So I think they were thinking of very classical, tradition, traditional Christian music. But I always say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm doing that. And thinking in my mind, yeah, on Sunday nights from 9 to 11, I'm hiding underneath my covers because I'm supposed to be asleep, listening to my big boom box to this uh, radio station from Augusta that I could barely get that would go and play songs from... Uh, uh, you know, Michael W. Smith and Twyla Paris. And that's actually how I rebelled as a teenager until my mother would come in, you're supposed to be asleep. I was like, mm, okay. And I was like, you know, quarter of 11 at night on a Sunday night and whatever. But so they would ask me those questions every, every, every week. And I knew that. Now, were they ever officially my disciples or mentors? No. But unofficially they were. And I think in the back of their mind, as we're going to talk about in a moment, they very much saw that that was their, their role in life. Well, so a couple of years went by, and uh, all the way through high school, and then it was my senior year in high school. 
And uh, early on, I think in that school year, and I don't quite remember all the details, but I remember going on a Sunday night, sitting down, and Mr. Bartlett said, well, I'm going to make an announcement tonight, but I want you to know it before everybody else does. And I'm like, okay. He said, uh, I had a doctor's appointment this week, and they have determined that I have terminal cancer, and I only have a short time to live. So he got up, and uh, he made that announcement to everybody there in that service that night. And a few months went by, but every Sunday night he would stand up, and he would go, and he would testify to the fact of God's faithfulness. He said, I have terminal cancer, but God has been faithful to me this week. See, discipleship sometimes is more caught than taught. So from the Bartlett's, I caught a whole lot of attitude, good attitude, and actions of how you live as a follower of Jesus. Uh, About a month before I graduated from high school, um, Mr. Bartlett passed away. And his wife lived many, many, many years after that. She must have been well, well, well into her 90s before she went to heaven. And, um, of course, I moved, graduated, moved away, went to college, went to seminary, but she was still always there at my home church. And, and any time I was there, she would always come up to me and she would always say these blessed words that I had only remembered again in the last few weeks. And she says, You're, my husband thought so much of you. And it was always like, oh. But talk about an encouragement. That's what we're talking about. That is a disciple maker. It can be formal, it can be informal. Now we're always looking at these identities, our purpose, but then the life patterns that go along with them. So four words I'd like to share with you today. And the first one is intentional. Intentional. If we're going to be a disciple maker, it needs to be intentional. So whether it be in the area of evangelism that we talked about last week, that's to be intentional. Whether it's direct evangelism, you're having a one-on-one conversation with someone about Jesus, or as we talked about some last week, kind of doing it together as a group, but still intentional. In the area of discipleship, whether it's direct discipleship, you're meeting with one-on-one or, or in a small group of people, uh, it, it needs to be intentional. It's like, okay, I'm going to be intentional. As I said, with Mr. and Mrs. Bartlett, even though it was very informal, I think for them it was very intentional. It was like, okay, we're going to ask Scott the same questions every week. And I think it was very intentional that when they saw this 14-year-old high school boy, and I think also there was, a, there was a number of people that were trying to get me to sit with them. I didn't know that. And it's like, oh, yeah, this is a young man that you know, is serious about the Lord, and he needs to be discipled. And so they're like, oh, come, come right over here. They were very intentional in asking me those questions every week. Now, the second word that comes to mind is relational. Relational. So let me give you a description that really might be a definition that you might want to use for a disciple maker, and it's this. Relational. Develop strong friendships so that you can discover where someone is spiritually and help them take steps towards Jesus. That's all we're talking about today. That, 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 that's, that's the summary right there. Develop strong relationships so that you can discover where someone is spiritually and help them take steps towards Jesus. That's what Paul did. That's what Silas did. That's what Timothy did. And discipleship can actually start maybe long before a person actually crosses the line in becoming a follower of Jesus. You, you're developing that strong relationship because that's so very important. Whether a person ever becomes a Christian or not, you need to become that, have that strong relationship to discover, well, where are you spiritually? And then it's like, oh, okay, can I, can I kind of help you and guide you in this process? Can I help you take next steps towards Jesus? And that may be for months or years or decades that you go and you kind of become that spiritual parent to them helping them, always concerned about them, always wanting the best for them, always wanting them to become more and more like Jesus. The third thing, this very important third word I think of, is transformational. 
transformational. So first of all, if you are going to be a disciple maker, if you're going to help somebody take steps towards Jesus, you need to have your own life being transformed, being changed. So that, that, that's very important. Don't want to forget that. But it's helping that person or that group of people to focus on, one, an understanding of the Bible, but also applying the Bible. It's not just Bible information. And this is where sometimes maybe we fall short. Because we just say, okay, we just need to get somebody to, to read and to understand and to memorize everything in this book, and they're going to be all set. No. Uh, that, that's actually not the case, because we can be hearers or readers of the Word, but we have to be doers of the Word. We have to apply. We have to live out what is found in the Bible. Now, this week in my own time reading the Bible, and I've already shared with some of you uh, earlier this week, but I've been reading in Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, uh, verses 9 through 14. You might want to write that down and read that portion of, for yourself sometime this week. Colossians chapter 1, 9 through 14. And so Paul is saying to the Christians at Colossae, yes, you need to have the knowledge of the Word of God, because Colossae, they were all about it's like all the secret knowledge. He said, no, forget about all that. You just need to know the knowledge of God. But you also need to have the wisdom to apply it to your lives. And the application is most important. So as a disciple maker, you want them to understand the Word of God, but you also want to help them to apply it to their lives. Otherwise, all you have are disciples that have all kinds of, as I said this week earlier, is Bible trivia. We can have all this Bible trivia, but Bible trivia doesn't get us anywhere. It doesn't score us any points at all. We have to apply it to our lives with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. So, you probably already know this, but we cannot change people. We cannot transform people. We can only help them seek God and to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. But as they experience life change, they will be excited to help others to experience the same life change. That's how it works. That's how it worked with the new believers in Thessalonica is they, they're like, wow, our lives are changing. Our lives are being transformed. We're different than we were even three months ago. We're not worshiping false idols anymore. We're worshiping the true and the living God, and we're being his servants, and we're sharing everywhere, and things are happening, and people are also following Jesus. So as that life change happens, people around will say, oh, wait a minute, something's different. You're, you're totally different than you were three months ago or three years ago or many years ago. I want to I know what the difference is. And that's, that's how it works. Now, number four is transferable. Transferable. Here's the expectation that we have to have right from the get-go. Expect your disciples to make disciples. And again, this is where over the years as Baptists we've kind of fallen short. Expect your disciples to make disciples. It's an ongoing process that just keeps going on and on and on. And so your goal is to train your disciples to pass on what you have, what they have learned from you. That's the expectation. I'm going to go and share this with you. Don't keep it to yourself. You go and pass it on. You go and live it out so people can imitate how you are living. Transferable. So, disciple makers, listen, this is very important as well. I have it in bold print in my notes. Disciple makers must model a personal evangelism and discipleship that others can imitate. Disciple makers must model a personal evangelism and discipleship that others can imitate. Keep it simple, keep it impactful, keep it memorable. Be sure that they pass it on. Now, that is something that we are just beginning to work on behind the scenes. Doug and I have been talking about that for a number of weeks, and we're going to continue that discussion, and that's going to kind of uh, go at different levels here. What is a personal evangelism and discipleship model that could easily be passed on to other people? And right now, we don't really have that clearly 
defined. So we're, we're working on that and, and providing resources and, and a handbook and, and a lot of those types of things. So we're working on that. Now, for a moment, I want to talk about reality. Reality. Because probably a lot of what I've shared with you today and over the last four weeks is like, okay, a lot of this is review. But reality, because I said when we started that as we begin, as we begin a new church year, this is, we, we really need to, to really focus on our mission of making more disciples for Jesus. How do, how do we go and do that? So here's reality. Um, three weeks ago today, I asked you to make out the spiritual assessment survey. Uh, 78 of you did that, so most of you in this room. So thank you for doing that. 78 adults made that out. Now, there was nothing in that survey that was was uh, totally shocking or surprising to me. But one of the things I wanted to share with you as far as reality, this is just reality, and it is what it is, that uh, 59, so basically 60% of you that made out the survey said that you have been a follower of Jesus for at least 30 years. Between 30 and 70 years. There's some people here that have been followers of Jesus you told me that in the survey. A number of you said, you know, I've been a follower of Jesus for 70 years. It's like, wow, that is great. So that's reality. Now, what you also indicated in your survey, and I was able to go back and it, and it matches up really well, is, and we know this, that the, typically the longer that you are a follower of Jesus, the less you are to share your faith with other people. Not because you're not committed, not because you're not willing, not that even that you're not able, but it is what happens, two things. One is that after being a Christian for 30 years or a long t- period of time, is that your network of friends and family um, have either already come to Christ because you've shared with them over the years, or that you've shared with them s- multiple times for 30 years, that they have said, you know, you have shared with this, this information about God so many times, not interested. So, um, so out of the basically 60%, um, very few people in that category of the 60% that sh- have indicated that they were able to share about Jesus um, basically more than once in, in the last 12 months. And the vast majority is like, nope couldn't do it at all in the last 12 months. So it's like, okay, now that's reality. Now it's interesting from the survey that for those of you that have been followers of Jesus for less than 10 years, and especially less than five years, that you shared your faith more than four times in the last 12 months. Now that's not surprising. That, that's, that's kind of what I expected. Now why is that? Well, so if you've only been a follower of Jesus for for five years or for a year or three years or something like that, you still have a network of people, of family and friends that don't know Jesus. And they've never heard about Jesus yet. So they're like, oh yeah, I, I, tell me more. So that's reality, okay? So going forward, what do we need to do? So we're going to put it up on the screen. This is going to be the takeaway. Let's join together to do evangelism and discipleship. This is basically what I said last week. I'm going to say it again. Let's join together. So older, younger generations, those that have been Christians for 30 plus years, those that have been Christians for five years, how can we go and bridge the gap, bring you all together, that we can all work together to go and to share about Jesus and in intentional discipleship. Is that possible? Well, of course, I I think it is. So, what might it look like? And again, we're in the very early, early stages of kind of dreaming and exploring about all this. But let's say, for example, that uh, 30 or 40, no, 20 or 30, I don't know, 15, 20 people were to get together uh, at church and uh, some of the people that have been Christians for five years is like, okay, I'd like to go and, and invite some of these folks. And, but could some of the older Christians kind of offer support 
And it might be, and we've done this in the past in the church many times before. It's like, well, yeah, I, I, could, make a, you know, I could make some brownies. Would that be helpful? Yeah, that would be great. Uh, yeah, if you could drop off the brownies, and, and that would be very helpful. Now, we've done that in the past, you know, with Alpha, something like that. Well, what about maybe a, in a smaller setting, maybe some kind of home group, something that doesn't meet in the church building? And, you know, you've been a Christian for a long, long time, 30, 40 years. You might say something like this, well, we could come over, or I could come over and watch the kids for a while. Uh, maybe we could play some games. Uh, maybe you could even do a simple Bible lesson or something like that could do that. I, I could help you out so you could go and do this with your non-Christian friends. Or maybe in, in a life group setting, um, it's like, boy, I, I don't have the energy to make brownies. I don't have the energy to, to watch any kids, but I do have a lot of Bible trivia, and I do know where a lot of things are in the Bible. I could be part of your group, and I could just kind of sit there and be a resource person. I don't plan to say anything. I'm not going to lead the group. But uh, if you're stuck as a new Christian, it's like, uh, um, you know, it's like, am I really messing up? It's like, well, maybe you could look at this passage in the Bible. See, that would be examples of how we could all work together to do evangelism and discipleship. And I said we're just beginning to explore and we'll need to experiment. How might this all work? Now, I do not want to end on kind of a somber note because I want to end on a very high note. So I want to do that by asking you a question and then to look at a couple more verses and it will be done. So the question is, do you want to have joy in your life? Do you want to have joy in your life? Do you want to have more joy in your life than you currently would say, I have right now? Now, if so, the answer I'm going to give you is that you need to be involved in the disciple-making process. Because when I think back over my life, that the times that I've had the most joy, I mean, like right over the top joy, excitement in my life, in my Christian life, are those times that I have been involved in the disciple-making process. Now, what do I mean by that? By helping someone understand who Jesus is? That's, that's exciting. That just fills me with joy. Or helping someone take one more step towards Jesus or explaining something from the Bible, the greatest joy. Now, that's just not my opinion. This is actually what these three chapters of 1 Thessalonians say. So let's go back very quickly to chapter 1 in verse 6. I read it earlier, but I didn't really note on, make a note on this. But verse 6, chapter 1. It says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. Remember, I read that. And for you welcomed the message, the message of, of, of salvation, the message of Jesus, in the midst of severe suffering and persecution with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. So here they are, these new Christians, these new disciples Oh, severe suffering, severe persecution for going from being Jewish to Christian or, from, you know, going and worshiping all these false gods. And they're like, no, we're not going to do that anymore. And all their friends, you know, all the peer pressure is like, what do you mean you're not going to go and worship over this God anymore? No, no, I'm worshiping the true and the living God, the Christian God. I'm going to do that. There was great suffering and persecution. But what does it say? What did Paul say? That with joy, given by the Holy Spirit, in the midst of all this suffering, they just had this tremendous joy. So I would say to you today, if you're listening, if you're here in this room, and you do not have joy, either one or two things, you need to become a follower of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit will give you automatically this great joy. And if you've been a follower of Jesus, let me remind you today that the Holy Spirit is the one that gives you that joy. And so be reminded of that. It's like, oh, wait a minute, I have joy. The Holy Spirit gives me joy as a follower of Jesus. But let's go kind of to a next level here because that's just kind of automatic. Chapter 2, verses 17 and 19, to kind of tie it into what we've been talking about this morning. Chapter 2, verse 17 
says, but brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you, for we wanted to come to you, certainly I, Paul did, again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of the Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Now, Paul is picturing here that in in Paul's mind that Jesus could come back at any moment, as we still believe today, at any moment Jesus could come back in his second coming. And Paul says, when that moment happens, whenever that moment is, when I'm in the presence of the Lord, my hope, my joy, my crown is going to be able to go and say, uh, Lord Jesus, let me introduce to you my friends from the city of Thessalonica. And I, and I think if that hasn't already happened for Paul, that will happen someday. And the Lord Jesus may go and say it this way, uh, Paul, uh, is there anyone here that you'd like to introduce to me? You know, Lord, the Lord is always so gracious to say, yes, Lord Jesus, there is. And it's like, oh, Paul, it's like, here are my friends that I've loved and cared about from the city of Thessalonica. And, and, and Jesus, I, I was the one that shared who you are. And, and they came to have that personal relationship and they, and they grew and, 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 and look at them. Paul says, oh, on that moment, the joy that I will have. Think of it. It's like, wow. Now, that's in the future at some point. And if you can't wait for that, uh, in chapter 3, verse 6, Paul talks about the joy that we can experience even right now, today, this week. In verse 6, but Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live. (laughs) Isn't that? I love that. For now we really live because since we are, you are standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. And so Paul says, every time I'm in the presence of the Lord, you're on my mind. And the joy that fills my heart and my life to think that I've had this opportunity to to help you come to Christ and to see you grow, and you're standing firm in the faith. Nothing makes me any more happy than that. It just fills me with this tremendous joy. It's like, wow. Now, in closing, when we think about a worship service on Sunday morning, I've been thinking about that a lot recently. And part of that is preaching, and, and they tell us that in, in that it should be training and equipping and preparation for the coming week. And hopefully today's sermon and, and these certainly in the last few weeks have been that to prepare us to live the rest of this week of what we are to be. We are to be a worshiper and a servant and a witness and a disciple maker. But also the worship service on a Sunday morning such as this is an opportunity to rejoice in what God has done in this past week, in this past month, in this past year, in the past months, in the past years. Joy in the presence of Jesus, but Lord Jesus, when we think about the people that we've led to Christ, the people that we've helped grow in their relationship with Jesus, whether it's that we've prayed for somebody, whether we have encouraged somebody just informally, or we've gone and we've spent the whole week mentoring multiple people. It doesn't matter. But when we come into the worship service, this joy should just be overflowing, that we have this appreciation that God has allowed us to partner with him in his great plan of salvation. 
And when we gather here, it's like, wow, this is like the greatest thing ever. God, thank you for allowing me and for us to partner with you to see people come to worship you and to serve you and to testify of your goodness and faithfulness and allowing us to help people move towards Jesus. There is nothing greater than all the world. And that is what a worship service is really all about. Now, each week in these weeks in February, I've given you a prayer or two to pray. And here's the last one, and I will sometime this week, I will remind you of the various ones I've challenged you of how to pray. But it would be this, Lord, give me a desire. All of these have been based on desire, because this is not out of duty. This is out of desire. Lord, give me a desire to experience this joy right now. And someday in the presence of the Lord Jesus, as I lead people to Christ and help them grow in the relationship with you. Give me that desire. Not out of duty. Not because, oh, I'm a Christian and I have to do these things. As oftentimes we think, or I'm a religious person and I have to, oh, I have all these things that God is expecting me to do. No, that's the wrong way to look at it. God, Lord, give me this desire to experience all of this joy, this joy that I've maybe never experienced before. Allow me to go and to be all that you want me to be. So let's take a moment. We're going to, in a moment, ask the worship team to come forward, and they're going to sing this song that they've taught us over this last month. Oh. Yes, I forgot to do something. Okay, we'll do that next week. So, the worship team is going to lead us in a song that they've been teaching us over the last month. And it's about grace, because all of this is not out of duty. It is not out of our own strength. It is by God's grace that he gives to us the ability to do all these things. In the song that we will sing in a moment, we've been learning this month, it is by grace that we are redeemed. It is by grace that we are restored. It is by grace that we can lead someone to Christ. It is by grace that we can help someone to encourage them to be the men and women that God wants them to be. It's all by grace. So I'm going to ask you to to bow with me in prayer. And what I want us to do, what I want you to do, is to think about over the years, maybe it's maybe maybe it's been over the weeks or maybe over the months, depending on how long you've had a relationship with the Lord. But people that you've talked to, people that you've encouraged, even in the slightest way, moving them towards Jesus. Be able to celebrate that before the Lord this morning. And ask the Holy Spirit to fill you with joy to realize that indeed we have been partners with him in this great plan of salvation. And to think back of the people that have encouraged you over the months and years. That they have helped you move towards Jesus. That maybe they're the ones that actually explained how to have a relationship with Jesus in the first place. Be filled with joy And give God all of the praise for what he has done in your life. Lord, we commit all this to you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for how you have moved in our lives to this point. Lord, we know that we are still a work in progress for each of us in this room and each person that is listening to my voice today. We are all a work in progress somewhere in this spectrum of moving towards Jesus. Wherever we are today, we pray that even in these next moment or two that we would move one step closer to you. Lord, through your Holy Spirit, I pray that you would work in each heart, mind, and life today, that we would become more like the Lord Jesus and how we think and how we speak and how we act in our attitudes our motivations, 
that we would be true worshipers and servants and witnesses and disciple makers of you. God, through your Holy Spirit, give us that strength and ability to do it. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So let's stand as we sing this song together. Your grace that leads the sinner home from death to life forever and sings the song of righteousness by blood and not by merit. Your grace that reaches far and May be seated. Thank you, worship team. Just a couple of quick announcements and we'll be done. So for the teens, you are going to have a time of pizza and a movie. If you could meet together as a group out by the children's check-in center out here in the lobby, and uh, we will get you on your way. So that will be your meeting place. So there's no cost to that. There will be free pizza at Angelo's and then uh, a movie back here at the church downstairs. For the ladies, it's the women's luncheon day. So there's going to be some moving around here and uh, changing things up, getting ready for that. And uh, that should start, I think, at about 1130 or so. And uh, so uh, it should be a great time for all the ladies today. Uh, let's see. Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, this uh, past Thursday night, uh, Dr. Barnes uh, was at the university. Wow, that was great. It was very powerful, very well done. About 100 people there or so. Uh, many of them students from the uh, university. Uh, a number of them certainly uh, not followers of Jesus. There were some students that were Christians that were there. Uh, Many of you were there, so that was great. Um, I learned more about physics than I ever did in high school in about 20 minutes, so that was that was great, almost to the point that it's like, boy, I want to take a physics class. Uh, It's really good stuff. So how all that fits in with uh, this 
finely tuned cosmos that God has built for us is just absolutely amazing. So that was, that was good and uh, so great. Uh, so starting next Sunday, Doug is going to be leading a class, a group after the service for a number of weeks of how to go and to share your faith and uh, what evangelism is, the, es- the es- uh, essence of the gospel, um, how to use questions and all that, uh, using your story, stories of the Bible to go and to do all that. So really good stuff. And uh, so you don't know how to do any of that. Uh, that will be offered for the next uh, uh, four or five weeks. So we've already done our prayer time, so let's go and we'll just stand and close in prayer and uh, we will go on with our day. And uh, thank you for being here and uh, for being such good listeners this morning. And uh, so let's go and, and commit all this into God's care. God, we know that uh, it's more than just listening and reading is about doing. So we want to be doers of your word, not just hearers. So, God, we need your help through your grace to do that. Even this day, as we are given opportunity to encourage someone or to lead them towards Jesus, Lord, give us the boldness and the courage and the ability to do that. Lord, as we, as a church, figure out what all this will look like in the weeks and months and years to come, God, guide us as we explore, as we experiment, uh, to make more disciples for Jesus Christ, to really live out our mission that we've been talking about for these recent years, that we would not just talk about it, that we would actually do it for your glory. To that end, we would pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day.